I believe that every time that we are faced with Jesus Christ, we need to make a choice. My job is to invite you, not only to see Jesus Christ, but invite you to the foot of the cross to experience Jesus Christ. To be a disciple. Last time we were together, we took a look at John chapter 8, verse 31, where Jesus said to his disciples, Abide in my word, and you are my disciples indeed. And so he talked about abiding in the word and being his disciple. We're going to look at different passages over the next weeks, looking at that specific subject. What does Jesus say a disciple is? specifically. And it's amazing that Jesus was very specific on this subject. He talked to his disciples and told them to be one of mine. These are the things that I expect. These are the things that you will do. If you're a student and a follower of me, then you will, and the first thing was abide in his word. The second thing that Jesus says that we will do if we are his disciples is found in John chapter 13. And why don't we turn there? The book of John chapter 13. We're going to look at verse 34 and 35. The book of John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does the Bible teach about this subject? Not what are, what's our opinion, not what is it we think it means to be a disciple, but what does the Bible say? John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. The Bible says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all know that you are my disciples." if you have love for one another. So notice there in the scripture it says, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. The identifying mark of being a disciple of Jesus is that we love one another. And that it will be such a visible sign, such a powerful sign, that, that the world will take notice, that people will see that there's something different about us, about our lives, about the way that we relate to each other. That something within us as a body of people will be so intensely marked that the world will take notice and they will say, they have been with Jesus. They they are, there's something going on there. That is the truth, and I'm interested in it. And what is the sign? It's simple, that we love one another. The, the difficulty is, is that we throw around the word love a lot. We, we, many, we use love for everything. You know, I love, I love my wife, I love my kids, I love my house, I love my dog. We say, we say I love that television program. You know, we say, I love you to people, and then we don't love them anymore, and then we say, I love you to somebody else. We use the word love, and we just throw it around. And so when it says that we must love one another, it means that we're going to have to look for a, a, a way to identify what this love is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to look like in the church. So love one another. Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is going to make another statement that I think is intimately related, and it's about being a disciple. The book of Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Book of Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. I believe that these two passages are linked, even though it doesn't use the exact same words. Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. The Bible says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be what? Be like 
his teacher and a servant that he be like his master. And he goes on, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? So isn't it interesting that, that Jesus now is teaching and saying that, that being a disciple, the goal of being a disciple is not to be greater than your teacher. As a matter of fact, most of us are not greater or will not be greater than your teacher. But when you're a student, your goal is to be like the teacher, to, to look at them, to see their life, to see their attitudes, their character, to have their knowledge, and to pass on, not just, not just information, but the way to be. And so as we, we go to school, we learn from teachers wanting to have the knowledge that they have, wanting to attain to who they are, to be the same. And Jesus is saying that is the goal of us being a disciple, that we would be like our master. And of course, as Christians, and within the Christian context, we are trying to be followers or students of our God, students of Jesus. And in that studentship, in that, in, in, in that relationship, the Bible says that our goal is to be like him. Like him in what way? That's why I think they're interrelated. Like him in love. And in other words, what Jesus is saying here is that our goal is to be like Jesus in all things. To strive to be like him. To, to, to in every way, study to be like him. Turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Another passage that speaks about this uh, concept. Ephesians 5. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. I like what Paul says here, because uh, I am, I'm an imitator, I always have been. I've been able to imitate voices through the years, or... Imitate people and pers their styles, and, and it's one of the things that I was good at as a child. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us, and offering in a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So here the Bible's saying that to be like our master, we are to imitate him. In other words, we are to model the way that we love within the church as we love one another. We are to model our love after his love for us. And the kind of love that we are to walk in is the kind of love that he had. Now, can I, can I just talk about humanity for a moment? We as human beings, you know, I hate to say it, but I think somewhere deep down inside of us, we all think that we're loving. But I think what we do when we say, like, I'm loving, is that we compare ourselves with somebody else who we know is not loving. And as long as we're better than them, then we're a loving person. But I'd like for a moment to, to just take a moment and pause and say that we're talking about being loving like God is loving. And all of us could grow up into that because none of us are there. And so this is not the moment to think about somebody who's not loving and to think, oh yeah, they really need to hear this sermon. I, I think that this talk could be for us all. And that there's something for all of us to grow up into, the fullness of the stature of who Christ is. And, and that's really where we're going with this. What kind of love did God have? Turn to John chapter 3, verse 16. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 16 uh, of course, this is familiar to us, and we're going to move quickly through a few of these verses. John chapter 3, verse 16. This is what you see at football games as the uh, kicker's about to kick the, the ball through the uh, post. Someone will hold up a big sign, John 3, 16. Well, here it is, the famous verse in the Bible. John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that... Whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So the Bible says that God did what to the whole world? He loved. 
How many did he love? The world. God loved the world. Who's in the world? Who's excluded from the world? <laughs> no one. Hey, I want you to hold on to this thought for a second because we're going to go a little deeper into this. You mean even the bad people are in the world? God loved them? In what way did he love the world? How did, he, how did he show that it was real, that it wasn't just words? Sometimes we say to people, I love you, but then our actions don't say love. How did God show that his love was authentic and that he really did love all the people in the world? What did he do for the whole world? He gave his son. He gave the most precious thing that he had, the thing of the highest value, he gave it to the world. He gave a gift, a gift that cannot be priced. It's, it, it was, uh, it's, it's more valuable than the whole universe. It was his son, and that gift was Jesus. That, that God gave to the world to reveal the love that he had for us. That's incredible. Now, who did he give his son to, his most precious gift? He gave it to Adolf Hitler. He gave it to Saddam Hussein. He gave his son to, to me. He gave his son to you. He gave his son to the Jeffrey Dahmers and the, and the, um, and the, and the serial killers and the, and the murderers and the rapists and the angry and the bitter and the, and the frightened. He gave it to the greedy and the hurtful. God gave his son to imperfect people, undeserving people. Did the world deserve that gift, that quality of gift? Absolutely not. And so God's love is revealed in that he gave something of highest value to someone who didn't really deserve it. That's you and me. Are you following my thought process? Turn your Bibles to the book of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John is at the end of the Bible, near the book of Revelation. The book of 1 John, end of the Bible, near Revelation, not to be confused with the John we were just in. That's a different book. 1 John chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That makes sense. God's will is for us that he would deliver us from the power of sin, that we would have no more part in that. But there's grace for those who fall. That's a beautiful passage. Verse 2. He himself is the propitiation. That's a word that means atonement or the forgiveness, the, the, uh, the, the atoning sacrifice uh, on behalf of sin. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, the forgiveness, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for who? For the whole world. So the sacrifice of Jesus that atones for sin is not something that was given just to believers. Do you know how he's specific? He says it's, it's, not, it's not just for our sins. You see the language. He's very specific about what he's saying. John is saying it's not just for our sins, but it's for the, the, the sins of who? For the whole world. In other words, God did something amazing. Not only did he give the most precious gift to those who were undeserving, but he also gave the atoning sacrifice, forgiveness of sins, not just to believers who believe in him, but also people who would never believe in him. He gave grace and he showed love to them. If you want to be more specific, go to John chapter 1, verse 29 John chapter 1, verse 29, it's a statement, that's the book of John. Sorry, I got you going back and forth. 
I probably should change the order on that for you to make it easier. John chapter 1, verse 29. Here's a statement that John the Baptist makes when he sees Jesus. And he makes this statement, uh, proclaiming it boldly before a whole crowd of people. Very interesting what he says. The book of John, chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all those who confess and believe in him. Is that what it says? John 1, 29? No. What version of the Bible do you have? You have the same one that I have most likely. I was just reading it wrong on purpose to make sure you were awake. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the really good people who are called saints. That's not what it says? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of who? When Jesus became our sacrifice and he went to the cross and he died for us, and, and, and we express things like, oh, he took the sins of the world upon him. We don't think about what we're saying. What we're actually saying is that God took the sins of rapists and killers and murderers and unkind and, and ungrateful and, and bitter and hurtful like us. And he took those sins upon himself. He paid the price for them. The Bible calls it a ransom, literally, a ransom. He paid the ransom price. And he did it, literally took away the sin of the world according to the Bible. Took it upon himself. Now, if someone ends up dying in their sins, it's not because the price wasn't paid, but because the one who made the purchase was not allowed to receive it. Um, it wouldn't be very kind if you bought something. Have you ever paid for something on the internet and then have it not show up? Right? And after a couple weeks, you get a little bit irritated and you make a phone call. Right? Hey, I paid for this. You collected my money, but I've had not delivery of my item. Where is it? You get upset about that. Jesus paid the price for the sin. He is the atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world. He took away the sin of the world. The only way that we will be lost is if we do not let him receive what he paid for because we hold it back to ourselves and we hold on to our sin. And by the way, it's not fun to not receive something you paid for, especially if the price was high. And Jesus paid a high price for our sin. To withhold our sin from him would be wrong. And so why not let him have what he paid for? Stop holding it back from him. Turn in the Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Timothy is, uh, is close to the book of Hebrews, which is near the end of the Bible, before it. Uh, bef it's after the Thessalonians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, the book of Timothy, it's one of those that's a little challenging to find, but, um, but I'll go a little slower as you look for it. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. It's before Titus. And 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Paul speaking about the reason why he's so passionate to serve God. 1 Timothy 4.10 says this. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. You see, Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. He is the Savior of all men. And how many are included in all men, by the way? All. All. Jesus is the Savior of all men. That's what the Bible says. Not just some, but all. But I want you to notice he's, the, he's a Savior especially of those who believe. Why? Because when you believe, you get to experience it. You see, God did something very loving for all. 
But when you accept it and believe in it and receive it, then you're especially blessed because you get to actually enter into the experience that Christ has given to us. But He's still the Savior of all men. Jesus and God our Father, when they met and talked about the sin problem, did something incredible and amazing. They were willing to give to rotten, ugly, disgusting people the most precious gift that heaven could give, the life of God Himself, to be able to save us. And He became the Savior of the whole world. The problem is that there will be many that will say no. There will many, be many that will choose a different way, will choose a different, choose a different lifestyle, will choose a different choice, will choose to hang on to their sin, will choose pleasure rather than peace. There will be many that will reject the precious gift, and that's a shame. Now, let me get practical. I was a little bit theological on purpose, and the reason I'm doing this is because I wanted to talk about what love is supposed to look like. And since God is our example of love, I wanted to make two points kind of strongly. Number one, God does not treat us as we deserve because we do not deserve Jesus. We do not deserve salvation. We do not deserve heaven. We do not deserve righteousness. We do not deserve peace. What do we deserve according to the Bible? Death. 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 For the wages of sin is death, the Bible says, Romans 6.23. So we do not deserve all that God has given to us. So God is not treating us like we deserve. He's treating us better than we deserve. So within the church, the first, thing I, the first point I want to make is that if we are to love one another the way that God has loved us, then we should not treat each other the way that we deserve but we should treat each other in a way that we do not deserve because God does not treat us as we deserve. Now, we live in a world that has to treat people the way they deserve. We feel really good about that. As a matter of fact, most of the movies that will come out and you'll be watching, there's a hero and a villain. And the villain deserves justice and punishment. And we cheer at the end when the good guy gets the villain and he gets what he deserves. We cheer about that. It's in our, it's in our, we call it justice and we're happy when that happens. And yet the Bible teaches that the love that we, it will be revealed in the church is a love that will cause the world to take notice. Why? Because it will be a place where people do not treat each other as they deserve, which will be different than everywhere else. The second thing that I want to say is that God is not treating us as though we have sinned. Not only is he not treating us as we deserve, but God is not treating us like we've sinned. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, we've already looked at that he is the forgiveness of sins, the propitiation for not just ours, but for the whole world. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the Savior of all men. In the book of Psalms, let's open to Psalms, chapter 130. Let's open to Psalms, 130. Psalms is in the middle of the Bible. It's before Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. And uh, Psalms is after Job. It's kind of in the center. It's usually a pretty easy one to find. Psalms, chapter 130. Psalms, 130. While you're turning there... Let me just make a comment about this idea that God is not treating us as though we have sinned. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but you and I are not dead. So therefore, God is not treating us like we deserve because we deserve to die, right? But I want you to go even farther. God is not treating us as though we have sinned. Because if God were to treat us as though we have sinned, then we would deserve death because the consequence of sin is death. Notice that Psalms says that. Psalms 130, verse 1, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? Now, now what Psalms 130, verse 3 is saying is that if God were to begin to mark or keep record or keep track of our sins or hold to our account our sins, then what does he say? Who could stand? Who could be alive? 
Who, who, would, who, could, who could breathe? So the fact that you're alive means that God is not really treating you like you've sinned. He's treating you with love and respect even though you don't deserve it. Now you know within the church we have a problem and the problem is, is that we treat, we kind of do that, we treat each other like we've sinned. We, we have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to treat people like the sins that they've committed. Yet, yet God does not treat us that way. As a matter of fact, the verse 4, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, verse 3, who could stand? Verse 4, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. He says the reason why we stand and, and that we're positive that, that our iniquities have not been marked or kept against us is because, is because there's forgiveness with God. And so therefore, and I'm, and I'm following my logic through, therefore, if these things are true, how should we relate to one another within the context of the body of Christ? We should not treat each other like we deserve, and we should not treat each other like we've sinned. When you come into the house of God, you should be treated like you do not deserve. You should be treated like a royal guest. When you come into the house of God, into the family of God, you should not be treated like you've sinned. You should be treated like you've never sinned. You should be received and accepted and embraced and shown grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. Did Jesus treat people like they sinned? Turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 9. Let's take a moment and look at a, a couple examples the book of Matthew chapter 9. Let's just look at a couple. I, I tried to choose different examples. There's a couple that I really like to use that usually make the most impact on me. I tried to pick a couple different ones today. Book of Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. Book of Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. So he got into a boat and crossed over and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Wouldn't you like to hear those words from Jesus for you? What would it mean to have Jesus say the words to you, Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. What would that mean to you? You know, we live with, with uh, stress. We live with um, regret and sorrow. We live with shame and guilt. We, we carry so many burdens around as human beings. We have to go to psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists and counselors and coaches and all these different things to deal with this, this weight of burden that we carry around. And, and, and yet, what would it mean to hear from our God who loves us be of good cheer. He's saying, be happy, be joyful. Don't, don't wallow in the mire of, of, of doubt and pity. And, and instead, he says, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And by the way, that is a fact. Because the Bible says that Jesus took away the sins of the world. He was the Lamb of God. That he is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. That he is the savior of all men. That includes you. So therefore, the word spoken in comfort to a man who, who lived in turmoil and stress were words of peace that were spoken to all. How much confession, by the way, did this man do before he received the forgiveness of sins? How much confession? How, you know, do you notice what happens to him? Jesus lets him know, friend, realize, accept, come to, the, come to the conclusion, you know, grasp this fact, grasp this truth. Your sins are forgiven you. Be of good cheer. How many good works did he do before he could experience or grasp the words of Jesus? I mean, just think about it. Did this man deserve these words? Absolutely not. Are you following me? I see you looking at me. How, how, did he deserve to hear those words? 
I know what you want to think. Oh, but Jesus knew, like, you know, two miles back, he, he said a, a, a prayer, and he heard that prayer, and I know what you're thinking. It has to be different. It can't be like that. You, you have to, to be accepted. You have to be good. You have to do right things, and this is a man who is paralyzed, laying on a bed. He was helpless. He was a mess. He had guilt and shame because in his day they taught if you're sick or injured, it meant God didn't love you and you must have sinned. God turns, God turns to this man on the bed and says, friend, be happy because your sins are forgiven. God wants to say that to you today. You know that? Do you know the reason why we do not experience the forgiveness? Is because, is because we can't forgive ourselves. We could, we could almost believe that God could forgive somebody else, but we cannot forgive ourselves. Well, friends, it's beautiful. We don't have to forgive ourselves. God has forgiven us. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So you mean God is sitting up in heaven going, I'm not going to forgive you until you confess. Is that what he's doing? Does the Bible teach that? So then why do we have to confess to experience forgiveness? Because of us, not because of him. It isn't because he holds back forgiveness until he gets a confession. It's because in our experience, we need to come to God and we need to share it for ourselves because we hold on to it and we hide it. And hiding sin is not good for us according to the Bible. So we must get it out, and the place that we are to get it out is to God, the one who has already forgiven us in Christ. Turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 7. Let's look at another example. A woman in the Bible who experienced the forgiveness of God, and I want you to look at her love. The book of Luke, chapter 7. The book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third of the four Gospels, the book of Luke chapter 7, verse 36, we're going to read down through kind of quickly to get to where I want to. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat, and behold, a woman, verse 37 of Luke 7, a woman in the city who, had, who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, stood at his feet behind him weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, what theology did this Pharisee have inside of his mind? He's not announcing anything out loud, but it's inside of his heart. It's inside of his head. What theology? Does he believe in treating people like they deserve, or does he believe in treating people like they do not deserve? He believes in treating people like they deserve. That's his theology. And he's thinking in his mind, I wouldn't let a woman like that touch me in a million years. She is dirty, messed up sinner. We all know, everybody knows what she does. She, she's not a person that I want touching me, period. No way. Continuing, verse 40, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they had, done, had, had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. So Jesus very kindly just tells a story to him to help him. I, I want you to notice that does Simon deserve to be treated with respect and kindness after he in his heart is mistreating the woman who is treating Jesus with kindness and respect? <laughs> he doesn't deserve it, but Jesus loves him enough to open his mind to some new idea or some new concept. And so he says to him, which is going to love more? Now, it's easy. If a person is forgiven a lot of money, they're going to they're they're be very happy with that person. 
If the person is forgiven a little bit of money, he's going to be happy too, but not as much as if he's forgiven a lot. Makes sense. I want you to notice how Jesus describes the situation in verse 44. He turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. What kind of love does this woman have? A lot, I heard someone say. You're absolutely right. She's pouring forth love. Can't you see love just coming out of her? Just be, being expressed in such a way that her tears and her hair are all over Jesus' feet in honor and love for him. She can't even help herself. She is so joyful. How much love is pouring out of her? Verse 45, Jesus says, You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time that I came in. Which one is loving? The, the, the woman or Simon? The woman is. Jesus is making that point strong. He's saying, see this woman? She's kissing me. She's kissing my feet, the ones you didn't wash. <laughs> yeah, she's kissing me and she's loving. This is love. I want you to see this. Jesus is saying, see this woman? This is love. 46, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. By the way, it was a year's wages worth of perfume. It was a super expensive gift poured out all over the feet of Jesus. What was being expressed here? Jesus is saying is that love is being expressed here. This is what love looks like. And he turns to the stiff Simon and says to him, now let's compare you with this woman and let's decide which one really shows appreciation and love. Ouch. Let me ask you a question. If you were to say that your life was like a Pharisee or a woman who um, was called a sinner, which one would you say that your life more connects with in this story? Are you the one who weeps all over the feet of your Savior? Do you break the box of the most expensive thing you have on the feet of your Lord because you love Him? Or do you do the minimum? Which, which, you know, which one do you represent? Which one does your life connect with in this story? The punchline isn't yet, though. 47, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Now, is Jesus saying at that moment that now her sins are finally forgiven? Or is he saying that because she's doing all this, it's a sign that she's gotten it, that she received the forgiveness of God, that her heart has been broken on the rock, that Jesus is, is the love of her life and her relationship, and so because she understands how much she's forgiven. She can't help but love that much. But then he makes a statement that I think is an indictment against all of us. At the end of that passage in 47, but to him little is forgiven, the same loves little. Do you know why You know, Jesus said it himself, by this we'll all know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know why the world hasn't noticed yet? <laughs> do, you, do you know why the world hasn't taken notice? It's because we don't love one another like the woman. We love one another like the man. And in that idea or in that concept, it's a very reserved, appropriate, societally accepted function. He was well respected as a religious leader in his community. S Simon, Simon was an honored, very religious person. And it, today in our church, he'd probably be an elder. 
But Jesus says that he loves little because he's been forgiven little. Is that because he doesn't have enough sins? Is that because he only has a few sins, so therefore he'll never be able to love much? I've heard people actually preach that idea. I think that's ludicrous. To be able to see exactly what Jesus is saying, we need to understand that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That sin is not just something we do. Some, it's something that, it is a power that lives within us. It is a way we think, a way we live, a way we act. It is a selfish attitude. And Jesus is showing this man that he doesn't understand love or forgiveness. Would you model your lifestyle as a Christian after this woman or after this very respected religious leader? And yet Jesus says this woman is the model for forgiveness and love. 48, he then said to her, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> and those at the table who began to say to themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Her faith in what? Her faith in the atonement. Her faith in a savior. Her faith in a love that loved her in spite of who she was or what she did. How would the kind of love expressed by this woman, how would it look or how would it impact a church community? If we were to experience the forgiveness of God for our, our sins, if we were to begin to love with that abandon and that passion, to begin to love each other like that, not, not, not based upon what we see, but based upon the value that God puts on each other through his death on the cross, the value that God has put on every life, what would it look like? And, and friends, I'm, I'm admitting that I'm not even sure I know because I'm not sure I've ever seen it. I think we talk about it, but I don't think it reveals itself. It's so rare that, that books are written about it, and we all read them, but we don't experience it. But you know, that wasn't God's plan. God's plan that within his church community, love would be so expressed that the world would notice and flock in. And the early church, they actually experienced that kind of love because they gave up what was most valuable to share with the others within the community. I mean, they sold their homes and their houses. They gave up their retirements. They emptied themselves completely and shared with each other so that nobody had any need. Why? Because they loved with abandon. They broke the alabaster box. You say, why would they do such things? It's crazy. Because they loved the way God loved us. Because you see, God broke the box. The alabaster box of ointment that was a year wages. God broke that box on us. And he broke Jesus on the human race. And he poured out his love on the world. And then he calls us to love in such a crazy way. And he calls us to love the same way. Does that mean that there's no hope for the Simons in the world? Absolutely not. But friends, do you really want to go through life being forgiven little and loving little? Is that the experience that you want to have? Or do you want to experience the fullness of what God has for you? Do you want to experience the, 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 the fullness of what God wants to do in your life? You see, those who are forgiven much, love much. Two men came to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, one a tax collector. The Pharisee plays like this. Lord, thank you that I'm not like other men. An extortioner. I'm not a liar. I'm not a thief. And I'm not like this tax collector over here. Thank you, Lord. I pay tithes. I go to church. I fast twice a week. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't make me like this schmuck over here. The tax collector doesn't even look up to heaven. He's beating his breast and he goes, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
You can just see him bowed over and racked with, with need and, and hurt and pain and crying out to God and saying, forgive me. Let me ask you a question. If you were in trouble and you were hurting, and some, you know, something serious, if you were in trouble and you were hurting and something really, something really serious happened to you and you just couldn't tell anybody, which one do you think would be more understanding of your situation? Mr. Thank God I'm not like this guy over here? Or the guy who would beat his breast and say, be merciful to us. Which one do you think would better understand or be more sympathetic or more loving in your situation? Which one would you trust? I tell you, I put my money on Mr. Beat his breast and, and crying out, be merciful to me, a sinner. That if I came to him with my need and my problem, that he would be able to hear me and love me. Maybe we need more sinners and less righteous people in God's house. Maybe we need more people who are aware of their enormous need for the forgiveness and love of God. Maybe we need more people who will be willing to come to the king and say, I can't afford to pay my debt, God. I'm completely lost without you. Redeem me. Pay the price for me. I'd like to think that the call to be a disciple is the call to love much. To love one another much. To love God much. And to love in such a way that, that it would truly awaken the notice of all those who do not know love. God, help us as a community to experience the Spirit in our hearts and minds so that we can be all that God has called us to be. Thank you. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, here we are. We are sinners. And we come before you, almighty God, seeking grace. For Lord, we are, we are not within your, your will. We are, we're just going through the motions. We don't really surrender ourselves to you. We, we fall short of all that you have wanted us to be. And, and we admit it, God. And we come to you asking for something more, something real. <clears throat> we don't want just a religious uh, experience. We want a life-changing connection with you. And we want your forgiveness. We want the peace that comes from knowing that your grace is upon us. Lord, I'd like to invite just the, the people of God this morning. I'd like to, to invite them to just raise their hands if they would like to experience the love of God as described in your scriptures, to just experience your love in its fullness, not just a little bit of love, but they want a lot of love. They, they, wanna, they wanna know what it feels like, Lord, to love deeply, to love the way that you love, Lord. Would you just raise your hand to heaven? Don't be shy, raise it up and just say, Lord, I want your love. You can put your hands down. Lord, to experience your love, we need to experience your forgiveness. Forgive us much, Lord. Teach us to come to you and to cry out to you. Teach us not to be hardened in our own selfishness, Lord, but teach us to open ourselves to you. Love us, Lord, with all the fullness that you have already loved us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for listening. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.